The least effective sales enablement is the one that's just kind of like a hot potato. I don't know who owns it, but it's not me is basically the answer that I get when I ask people who owns sales enablement. That really leads to some bad consequences, I think. And anytime I hear someone call their sales team like a scrappy bunch or like they are real self-starters, what I hear is our sales team hasn't been well-equipped and we haven't given them the resources that they need. And so they've had to be scrappy. You are listening to This is Product Marketing, brought to you by Product Marketing Hive, the product marketing community that gives back. I'm your host, Louis Liu. In this episode, Megan Pratt, product and content marketing consultant at Megan Pratt Marketing, shares her experience in sales enablement. Let's dive into it right now. Hi, Megan. Welcome to the show. Hi, Louise. Thanks for having me. Great. So let's do a short introduction at the beginning. Tell us how did you get into product marketing? Yeah. So I started out my career with a degree in journalism, uh, pivoted from journalism into working at a small marketing agency where I wore many hats. Um pivoted from there into like an in-house role where again, wore many hats. Um, I was basically doing what I didn't know at the time was product marketing and then went from that role as managing everything from digital marketing activities to product launches to specifically focusing on product marketing um, at a marketing technology company. So that's kind of like a very abbreviated version of my career journey, but Um, looking back now, I've always done some form or fashion of product marketing. And the reason I was attracted to product marketing is because it really pulls together all the things I have always loved about my career, everything from those journalism skills that I learned, looking for stories, research, asking great questions, things like that, to the fundamentals of marketing, to really how to work cross-functionally with folks. All of those different types of things are found inside product marketing and So I think I'll stick with it for a little while. (laughs) That's great. Thank you for sharing. Our topic today is sales enablement. And then um, maybe let's start with the beginning and the foundational. What does sales enablement entail? Yeah. So I think it can be different for different companies. I've worked at companies where there's an entire dedicated sales enablement team who's responsible for that. And then I've worked at companies where it kind of is one of those hot potato items that is passed between sales leadership, marketing leadership, executive teams, and sometimes just nobody. From my vantage point, and my vantage point really includes mostly working for startup companies where sales enablement is a shared priority between the marketing and the sales teams. Um, Sales enablement really includes kind of two main aspects for me. So the one aspect is sales fundamentals. So those are things like, how do you make a good discovery call? What is the process that we're following here? And how do we train people on that? Um, The other aspect, which is really where my focus has most often been placed, is like customer and product enablement. How do we share the information that marketing, more specifically product marketing has about the product and about the market and customers with the sales team in really meaningful, intentional ways that really align sales and marketing and help our sales team be more equipped as they go into conversations? Makes sense. Like you said, there is an area that uh, there is no dedicated sales enablement teams in the company. Uh, Should sales enablement this responsibility uh, goes to product marketing or not? So if not, who else should be running the sales enablement? Yeah. So I've been in that situation several times over my career where um, usually what happens is I'll come in as like the first leader of product marketing. And also around that time is when the sales team has gotten to a big enough size that we start to realize that some more formalized enablement needs to happen. Um, it's at that time that I like to have a very clear, candid conversation with sales leadership, with marketing, like the VP of marketing CMO, or even the CEO and say, here's what I think product marketing should own. And here's what product marketing can't own. Um, here's what's on your plate. Here's what's on my plate basically. And usually my strategy entails saying that product marketing will own the product and customer knowledge portion. We're responsible for making sure that our sales teams know how to talk about the product. They know 
you know, when something new has been launched, they know before it's been launched, um, they have a uh, win loss analysis, they have competitive intelligence and I'll kind of be even that concrete and to like, these are specific areas that product marketing is responsible for. Um, and then I also name some things that product marketing is not responsible for. So product marketing will not be responsible for, uh, setting out the sales process and training people on that. We won't be responsible for, you know, how do we do a cold call? How do we do discovery calls? Um, that's really outside of my wheelhouse anyway. So I'm not going to be the best person to do that. And at the end of the day, when there's limited resources, you really do have to be that clear cut and say, this is what I can handle and this is what I can't. And then once you get that alignment, then you're able to back into a plan that is that really fills those needs, but also um, makes sense for your timelines and priorities. Um, can you describe in what situation or what criteria has to be met at this point that is starting to make sense to have a separate sales enablement function? Yeah, so what I often find is even when there is a separate sales enablement function, that team is still most often responsible for those sales fundamentals and will be responsible for coordinating with the product marketing team to make sure that uh, we understand the sales needs and things like that. So more often um, when a team needs like that separate sales enablement function, sales enablement training, uh, sometimes that person's also like an instructional designer. So has like that really formalized training and how to create training um, processes and things like that. The sales team is much larger than say it would be at a startup. When I'm at a startup and I'm just implementing sales enablement, usually we have like 10 to 15 folks. And then once it gets past, I don't know, I'd say maybe like 25, 30 larger, that's when you want to start thinking about a formalized sales enablement plan and a sales enablement person, because you just get more people. At that point, you're probably separating the teams out into several different sales teams. Maybe you're separated by geographies or or by product lines, but you want to make sure that they're unified between those. Um it's at that point when you start to notice like misalignments in actual functional processes. Um, that's when you want to start thinking about like a formal sales enablement trainer person who's going to not only manage, like I said, those sales fundamentals and training people on that, but is also going to be doing surveys, is also going to be like proactively noticing gaps in people's knowledge and then finding ways to fill those gaps. Uh, you just mentioned the sales training sessions. From your experience, what would be a good cadence for running the sessions? Yeah, so my strategy, the one that I've found to be most useful, and this is through a lot of trial and error, you know, doing too many trainings and having people feel frustrated about that and doing too few and having people kind of wonder, leaving gaps in people's knowledge that shouldn't be there. What really works best for me is that we have an every other week training cadence. Um, what I'll usually do is I'll work with sales leadership and I'll say, okay, uh, we're going to do every other Friday at lunchtime. Um, maybe we can order in lunch for everybody, make it kind of like eventize it a little bit. Um, one Friday of the month will be the sales team's job to fill. And you can fill that with sales fundamentals. So Maybe we're going to listen to the best discovery calls of the week and talk about what makes them the best. Or maybe there's a process thing that we want to cover inside Salesforce or whatever it might be. The other Friday of the month um, would be product marketing owned. So that's when I would come or a member of my team would come and we would say, okay, we need to, we have a product launch coming up. And so we're going to tell you how to talk about this new product launch. We're going to get you excited about it. And we're going to share some resources about it. So that's kind of how I've structured it. And that every other week um, and really making kind of a, an event out of it, that really works for folks because they start to realize like, okay, this is a consistent flow of information. I know what to expect. They clear their calendars for that. And not, doing it every week tends to be too much. Um, it's just too heavy of a burden on people's schedules. But every other week tends to be just enough that they digest the information and come back to the next one ready for it. 
Great, great. So beyond training sessions, are there any other format or activities that you could do as a product marketer? Yeah, definitely. So I'm a huge fan of what's called like just in time learning. So I think these training sessions that I usually do every other Friday are really just the bare minimum that's necessary. So when I talk about just in time learning, what I mean is how do we take those big sessions that are usually maybe like 45 minutes to an hour? How do we boil them down into shorter bite-sized pieces of information? That could be taking the actual recording of the training and like actually cutting it into chunks and posting it in Slack throughout the week and saying like, here's a reminder of what we talked about in the training about this specific persona or this specific thing, just really making it concrete and crystal clear. And then also taking those pieces and putting them in a place that's really easily searchable. Um, that could just be Google drive. Like it doesn't have to be super complicated. Um, it could be one of the uh, sales enablement tool, like high spot or something like that, that is actually built for that purpose to, um, structure resources, keep them organized and deliver resources just in time. Um, the other thing that I think is often overlooked when product marketing is owning sales enablement, mostly just because it does take some time. And time is in short supply, as we all know, is really being intentional about creating a feedback loop with your sales team. And so what I mean by that is I think a lot of times we think we know what the sales team needs. We think we're delivering the right kind of content. We're delivering based on you know product launches. Like, this is what I want to say to the sales team. This is what I want them to understand about this. But we forget that the next step to that is really listening and making sure that that hit the mark and really wanting to understand any other gaps in, in knowledge. Um, so for instance, sometimes I'll bring a, a training to the table and say, here's a product launch. And then if I hadn't stopped to listen, I would miss that the team was like, oh, well, I'm actually hearing about this competitor that you didn't cover or didn't know about. Can we have some information on that? Great. That makes us all better and all stronger if I understand that. And I think there's lots of different ways that we can do that. One of those being just like listening in Slack channels. I also like to ask for uh, an invitation to like maybe one sales team meeting a month so that I can actually just say like, hey, now's your time to give me any feedback that you want. Um, I will just sit here and listen. Um, that's been really helpful. And then generating those for like really close trusting relationships with the sales team and members of the sales and success teams so that they feel comfortable and confident in giving me information and giving me feedback. And they know that I'll do something with it, whether it's right now or in the future, they know I'm listening and I want to take action on that. So uh, Megan, what are your thoughts on the some of the sales enablement platforms available out there, Highspot or others? Yeah, I... I'm a huge fan of those platforms. I think they do a really great job at organizing content, surfacing things when people need it, providing functionality like video trainings or coaching. I think first though, you really have to consider your strategy. You really have to make sure that the strategic aspects are there first. For instance, I wouldn't come in to a new product marketing role where there hasn't been sales enablement. And I implement a technology purchase like right up front. I wouldn't do that. What I would do is I would first assess the process. I would see, you know, what are some things that we can do right now before spending this money, before kind of implementing this. And then once you're ready to implement a, a high spot, a show pad, something like that, then you'll be well placed to make that a successful purchase as opposed to something that, and I've done this too, you purchase it thinking it's going to solve all your problems and then it sits on the shelf, nobody uses it. Mm, I see. Do you have any helpful tips to share with fellow product marketers about building the trust between the product marketing function as well as the sales function? Yeah, definitely. That's something that in my experience at least, Nobody really sits you down and is like, okay, one of the critical parts of your job is generating this feedback loop and building a trusting relationship with the sales team. And even if they say that, there's no like how to do that. There's a reason why sales and marketing teams kind of have this friction relationship. 
And it's because we're working towards the same goal, but we see our worlds very differently. The number one thing that I always do, whether I'm coming into a new role, meeting a new person, working on a new initiative, is I kind of do like a listening tour. So I will ask for some time on people's calendars, some key people on the team. Usually that's the sales leaders. So maybe like the leaders of the different sales teams, but sometimes there are also just like influencers within the organization who have either been there for a while or just kind of one of those people that are natural leaders who naturally, you know, notice problems and can speak to them. And I will just sit down with them and just say like, what's on your mind? What can I help with? What are your expectations for how this project or this role or whatever is going to go? And then I just listen. And then I try and reflect back to them what I've heard and say like, so what I'm hearing from you is you feel like you're going into deals with very little understanding of the competitive landscape. Is that accurate? Great. What's a desired solution to that? And then we can kind of start to think about solutions. And then the next step is I, I take all of that information to heart and really try and craft a plan to make that happen. And then I go back to those folks and say like, here's my plan. Thank you so much for your feedback. Because of that feedback, I was able to put together this plan. Do you feel like this is meaningful improvement towards our goal, our mutual goal that we've just identified of giving you more competitive information or whatever it is. Um, and then we work on that together. I think the thing that I've noticed is like between the listening and reflecting and then very quickly following that up with even bite-sized chunks of um, progress, that is really what spins this feedback loop and then they start to trust you because I think just the listening, that's not enough. Just the putting out um, information, that's not enough because it won't be really based in what they, they've they told me they need. Um, so really it's both. And I think sometimes we do one, sometimes we do the other, but the best product marketers I've noticed do both of them. I've heard some of the product marketers, one of the challenges they ran into is that they are somehow being viewed not as strategic enough, somehow just gradually become the order table for the sales team. So how how do you sort of address this problem? Yeah, definitely. And I think specifically in our relationship with sales, it can feel a lot like that because I think um, in my experience, at least the sales team is really governed by either their last or their next interaction. So if their last deal, they felt unprepared about something, uh, or if they felt like they wanted a one-sheeter for this specific conversation that they didn't have, that's going to be the only thing on their mind. And they're going to come to you and say like, this is an urgent priority. I need a one-sheeter about this thing. Or like, we need more information about this. This has to be a priority. And we, as product marketers, most product marketers that I've met really want to help. We want to solve problems. We're, we're problem solvers. That's what got us into this position in the, in the first place. And so we hear a problem, we want to solve it. I would say that a lot of product marketers need to make the priority less about helping those urgent needs right now and more about backing up and understanding where the need is coming from. So for instance, if a salesperson comes to you and says, you know, I've been talking to a lot of people under this persona and I don't feel prepared to talk about it. None of our messaging is focused toward this persona, all of, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I think that's a common story that a lot of people hear. Um, instead of just jumping in and saying like, yes, absolutely. I'll do some research. I'll prepare a one sheeter. We're going to take care of this for you. What I would do instead is I would just ask some questions and say like, okay, tell me more about why you're talking to this person. If it's outside the messaging, are we sure it's a good fit here? Um, is there something else that could fit this need? Is it a misunderstanding between you and the customer? Let me listen to some of your calls and see if I can hear like the questions they're asking that you don't feel prepared to answer. And I think that's a tricky thing to ask product marketers to do because we're so busy that it's like, oh, you actually want me to go do more work? But that's really the only way to be more strategic is if you pull back, you pump the brakes a little bit, you don't try and solve the problem urgently, and you ask some questions. 
I think the other thing too is I think a lot of product marketers jump into their roles and immediately hit the ground running and start kind of cleaning up what, for lack of a better term, I call like product marketing debt. There's product marketing debt at every organization. It takes the form of one sheeters or trainings or web pages that need to be created. And, and we want to clean that up. But I would really encourage people to like take a step back and again, do some listening first, do some understanding first, do some like try and get the lay of the land before you just start solving problems and try and see things from a little bit higher of a vantage point. And then you can start to say like, okay, for instance, back to the original example, that persona that you were talking about that you don't feel prepared to talk to, I totally understand that. Here's why that's not a priority for me right now. We're really focused on this persona, this ICP. Here's why I've done some research to back that up. Anything outside of that, I'm not going to be able to equip you to talk to. And it can be as simple as that. That's not an easy conversation to have, but it's easier if you have first prepared like a strategy, a path forward, a roadmap for yourself and your team. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. That's a good approach. Thank you. Yeah. Then when it comes to uh, measuring the success of uh, sales enablement programs, um, how, how would you go about it? How do you measure the effectiveness of it? Yeah, absolutely. I think measuring product marketing is another hot topic that is kind of a controversial topic. I've heard product marketers say like, we shouldn't be held accountable for metrics. It kind of like muddies the water. I've seen people really push hard for product marketing to like own numbers and own metrics. I find myself somewhere in the middle. What I want product marketing leaders and, and product marketers in general to do is I want people to understand what the organization's goals are. I want them to be able to talk with a CEO or a CMO and say like, what are we driving towards? What's the pipeline number that we need to hit? Are we focused on MQLs? Are we focused on just getting demos? Like what is our goal here as a marketing team? Sales team, what is our goal here as a sales team? You know, are we laser focused on um, sales velocity? Do we just want to get people through the sales process faster? Do we want more conversations? Is it a specific persona? Like I want us to really concretely understand what everybody else's goals are. And then I want us to be able to speak to people about how our activities are helping their goals. So because we influence a lot and we don't own any numbers, we're not responsible for closing the deals or you know optimizing the website or executing a new marketing channel. We influence all of those. So I want us to be able to talk about how we influence those. And I think sometimes we miss the mark in being able to concretely say like, hey, when we last we talked, your goal success team was really to decrease churn in the following ways. Here are some things that I've done that have influenced your ability to decrease churn. We did some win-loss analysis on your renewal deals. So we really understand the reasons for churn now. And we did, you know, we designed some content that is going to really be helpful in decreasing that churn and, and all of those different types of things. Um, and I think that's really nice because product marketing is at the center of a lot of things. We can even work in a little bit more of a strategic role and say like, hey, sales team, the success team's goal is to really decrease churn in the following ways. I think we can take that up funnel and we can maybe think about the ways that the sales team's activities are influencing some of this churn and what can we do better up funnel a little bit. And we can act as kind of more of a strategic partner. Back to your earlier question of how do we be strategic? I think understanding the metrics and understanding how our activities influence that, being able to speak to that is a really great way that product marketers can start to make themselves more strategic. Mm. Great. So um, there's an interesting number on the Garner uh, of buying preferences. I'm just going to quote here. 43% of B2B buyers desire a seller-free sales experience. And mm. this number of millennial buyers is uh, 54%. So I want to hear your take on this. Maybe what does this mean for product marketers? Yeah, that's really interesting. I think um, 
I'd be interested to hear how that breaks down in kind of like segments, because I think what I've noticed based on kind of living in the world of B2B tech for a while is that for smaller purchases or even tech that people have purchased previously, um, maybe you're a repeat buyer, you don't necessarily want to go through the entire sales process. So maybe it's like, I've already used HubSpot before. I already know that I'm going to like it. I just want to be able to sign up and start using it. I think there's going to be a place for that. And I think what we need to get really clear on is what are the times and places that buyers want kind of like that consultative selling experience and what are the times and places when we want to just get out of their way and give them more of like a product led experience um i think there will always be a place for that seller experience but what i think needs to change and what will change is buyers make this preference more known to organizations and organizations start to adopt it um is that that sales experience will have to be more consultative. It'll be less about, let me give you a demo. Let me walk you through my sales deck and more about just like two human beings having a conversation about problems, solutions, how we can help you different opportunities and kind of what we can do together. That relational aspect will have to get stronger. Um, and that opens up a really interesting opportunity, I think for product marketers um, to equip teams to have conversations outside of just like, you have to stick to the sales deck. You have to say X, Y, and Z. You have to dig into these three pain points and ask these questions. It makes us be more of a partner and more, we have to do more research and we have to do more digging and we have to really deeply understand our buyers in order to equip our sales teams to be consultative. And in order to understand when, like I said, we need to say like, there's our subset of buyers at our price point really just want us to get out of their way for this. So we're going to create an experience for them. We're also going to open up opportunities over here and we're going to be clear about what those are and our strategies here. And product marketing really needs to take a front seat to that. Mm, great, great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for tuning into This is Product Marketing, brought to you by Product Marketing Hive, a product marketing community that gives back. Check out our website, productmarketinghive.com, to join our community, meet fellow product marketers, and access free resources, including training, playbooks, templates, and events. If you enjoyed our podcast, please subscribe and give a five-star rating on the platform of your choice. See you next time.